Hello and welcome to a brand new series of the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. Today we're in Sheffield as the World Championships is upon us, the greatest snooker show on earth. Coming up in today's show, Ronnie heads to the Crucible to chat to Dennis Taylor about the most famous snooker match of all time. Why did I do that? It must have been to say, I'm either going to win you with a shot or lose you. We'll round up all the news from this year's qualifiers. Plus, we'll hear from the man himself about his chances at Sheffield this year. The first World Snooker Championship was held 88 years ago, but since 1977, it's been held at the Crucible Theatre. Over the years, this place has played host to some of the most amazing moments in snooker. But for me and many others, still the greatest of them all has to be the 1985 final, when it came down to the final ball in the final frame. I've come down here today to meet the man himself, Dennis Taylor. Dennis, 30 years. Nice to see you. Since the day. It's to be in the crucible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Dennis, it's been 30 years since <laughs> that memorable night in 1985 when you played Steve Davis. Here we are sitting up at the top here looking down at the crucible. How does it feel being sat here rather than sat down there? I can't believe it's uh, 30 years, uh, Ronnie. What were you, nine? Nine at the uh, time? I was around about nine or ten, yeah. Unbelievable. You were still making maximum breaks then, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> that was the age I started playing, uh, incidentally. But now to be uh, to be back here, OK, I've been here every year since 1977, either playing or commentating. And um, cannot believe it's 30 years since Steve and myself uh, played that final. And uh, we never dreamt that people would still be talking about it. People wind me up saying that I'm always talking about it, but there's people that, that want to talk to me about it, and, and I've never been fed up uh, chatting about it. So what was going through your mind, 8 nil down? You're like, you know, first of 18, you're playing, obviously, the most dominant player is on the circuit. What was going through your mind at that stage? Well, as I say, I lost all seven frames. We used to play seven in the first session. I lost the first in the evening, and... The thing I was always thinking was, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just sitting in the seat. He's not making many mistakes. So I thought, well, just try and get one frame on the board. And the first frame that I got, really, if, if we had been level in score, Steve probably wouldn't have taken the green on because he remembers that shot. It stands out. It wobbled, and I potted the green to pink. And I remember raising my fingers, at least I've got one frame. But then, I, because I'd been playing so well, suddenly it kicked into gear. To be only 9-7 behind after that first day, well, I, I felt like I'd, uh, I'd, I'd sort of won the World Championship from 8-0 from down to be just two behind. So you're 9-7 down, coming into the final day, Bank Holiday Monday, everyone knows, the last day of the World Championships. You've obviously come back. You're feeling good, yeah? You're feeling good? I'm feeling fantastic. Uh, in fact, you just made the little mistake that Steve made as well, and everybody makes, because it was a Sunday. It wasn't a bank holiday ah, Monday. Okay, okay. Back then, in 85, it used to finish on a Sunday night. I guess why they brought the bank holiday in, because of that famous <laughs> match, <laughs> Dennis. You never know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I was so looking forward then, although I didn't get much sleep, and Steve never got much sleep. I mean, I was on such a high after being so far behind, so I didn't sleep much. But, as you know, when you get out there, sleep doesn't matter. The adrenaline, adrenaline. keeps you going. So I just wanted to get out there and get started, but I could never get in front of them. What's going through your mind at 17 or you've obviously, you've obviously had your back against the wall the whole time. You, by rights, you should be out of the game, but you're sitting here 17 or you, you don't really get many opportunities to win. You know, we're privileged to have won this title, you know, people that have won it. What was going through your mind at 17 or? It's hard to describe, and it's down to one frame after 17 days, and. Uh, you know, it, it turns out, you know, people say that's the greatest frame of snooker ever seen. If it had been the first frame of the match, it would have been the worst frame of snooker ever seen because in that last frame, we were both missing pots that you wouldn't normally miss. Uh, our safety game was, was excellent. There was an awful lot of safety went on in that last frame, uh, which lasted 60, 68, 68 minutes, minutes yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So it was just a, just a matter of, of hanging in, hoping you get a chance, and... And it looked like Steve wasn't going to dish up with one chance because I could tell by 
his face, as he could tell by my face, because when I'm under pressure, <laughs> and you've probably seen it a few times yourself, I get pink, and then I get red, and then I get slightly redder. The nugget, Steve, gets white, and then whiter, and uh, you know, so you got the complete contrast. He was going white, I was getting redder, and uh, it just captured the imagination, and uh, to finish up with 18 and a half million watching, uh, you know, you, you, if we hadn't known there was that many watching, I don't think we'd been able to lift the queue. That brings me back to the last frame, because obviously it came down to, I think, obviously Steve Pike, the last red, didn't get on the pink. You've was left with a brown, which I know you said was probably one of the best pressure balls you've ever potted. Yeah, Long I could, brown. Yeah, I remember I couldn't... Half a pocket. Yeah, I couldn't see a safety shot. It was down near the balk yeah. line, and uh, I thought, well, rather than try a safety shot after working so hard, I had it in my mind at that time, rather than try a safety shot, mess it up and Steve goes in and wins. I mean, what a way to lose. So I thought, have a go. If you miss it, you know you've gone out fighting. And when the brown went in, I was well, more than delighted. But, but the blue I had was a funny little blue, blue. across the cushion. And, uh, and, I, and I hit it, well, I potted it, but I, I remember trying to nudge the white off the cushion because I, I'm not good on the cushion. Uh, and it, it was clear the cushion and then the pink I knew if I potted the pink, I was leaving a double on the black. I mean, I had my mind made up then, I was going to have a go with the double Did on the black. Did you not see, think of the in-off with the white in the middle? Never, it was around one, two, three, never even so. dreamt of that. In fact, that's the first time anyone's mentioned that, so it would only be, only be you that would have spotted that one. I just decided that, uh, uh, I don't know why to this day, after I potted the pink, I went and kissed the little lady on the top of the, the lid of the trophy. Why did I do that? It must have been to say, I'm either going to win you with this shot or lose you. Took the double on, and all the people, I mean, it's so intimate here in the Crucible, and they're all in line with the middle pocket, so they started cheering, so I thought I'd won the World Championship, and I missed the pocket by a fraction. But luckily, it went safe on the top cushion. Do you feel destiny was there with you that night? At that stage, it was, because throughout that final, Ronnie, um, Believe it or not, I was I was chatting the whole way through that final to my mum. Yeah. There was two fellas behind me I was chatting to, but I was chatting to my dear old mum who died suddenly at 62 during the um, just before the Grand Prix, which I wasn't going to play in, and I did go and play in that and played the best snooker in my career. So she she arrived at the Crucible with me as well, because when I was under pressure, I had somebody to chat to, and when, when, when I did miss the double, and then Steve did mess up and double kissed it, I thought, well, this is the chance. Now, try and keep your head still. And we shot down past the blue spot, the green spot. Mm. Just try and keep your head still. Push the cue in and out four or five times, through in a straight line. The camera went behind my shoulder. What a twi Biggest twitch ever seen of the cruise. I understand all that. I mean, well, we're talking the final five, final four world championships. I mean, the nerves must have been unbelievable. And I know the blacks obviously come round the table. And a lot of people looking at the black, they think, no, it's, it's a bit of a gimme. But actually, into a blind pocket, 17 all, I don't really want to be playing that type of shot. <laughs> and you're standing right behind it. So what was going through your mind? You see Davis get up. He's got a black. By rights, people think he should park because it was near the hole. You're standing behind it. What are you thinking? Well, when I missed the black, because I missed it by so much, it nearly came into the yeah, pocket. You look, you look so like I'm looking down, I thought, I might fluke it. And when I didn't, I walked back. But then when I turned around, it wasn't as close to the pocket as I thought it was going to finish. Mm. Still expected him to pot it. Mm. 970 people here thought he was going to pot it. 18 and a half million at home thought he was going to pot it. But Steve, you know, never spoke about it for years. But he's great when he talks about it. He said as he got up to pot that black, I don't know if you've spoken to Steve about it. He said his legs, he didn't feel like his legs. And he walked across the floor there. He said his arms felt like somebody else's. And he's got down, as you said, back into a blind pocket. You hit them thick under pressure. His brain saying, don't hit it thick, don't hit it thick. And he didn't. He hit it too thin, he overcompensated. And uh, I mean, he, he knew that I wasn't going to miss the black because it was easier than the one that he missed. But even still, I know any, you know any ball's missable, but under that type of pressure, that black for you to pot it, did you think, oh, don't twitch, don't do this, or was you like, no, this is going in, I, I'm not missing this, this is well, it? Well, I've done the twitching on the previous shot, so, and, and somehow that white, you know, fate again, how that white, from that angle, I've often tried to set it up, how the white went round the table so far, if it had stopped at the blue spot, me with the rest, Impossible. forget about it. <laughs> you know what I was like with the rest. I mean, it was a good job there was no stats back then. It would be one out of a hundred. And it kept on going. 
But you know that final blank, Ronnie. I never, I never gripped the cue. You know, you got all different grips and that. But all I did, I kept my thumb out of the way, and the cue, the butt was just on the four fingers, and I took ages on that shot. When when you, they show that shot, it looks like it's on freeze frame. I took that long, and really so that I wouldn't snatch a jerk at it, I just let go of the cue and. Uh, that lovely little black <laughs> disappeared into the corner pocket. Fantastic. Dennis, it's been great speaking to you. Listen, you're doing a great job. Love the show, by the way. But before we go, we've got to do the final black. Oh, you're going to play. I have to do the final black. <laughs> Can I be you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Can that would be you? good, because I would miss it. Got, yeah. <laughs> right, we're going to do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Stay tuned, as after the break, we'll see if the rocket can rewrite history. Recreation of the famous black ball finish. Dennis, this is the black that you left Steve here. To me, this looks like quite potable to me here. <laughs> I think every, everybody thought he was going to pop it. We haven't got like 18.5 million people and final fan world championships, but you know, what is, I mean, listen, I mean, this is, I've got to have a go at this. I think you should have. I can't have, you, miss have, that. have you ever, you've never tried this? Sean? Never no, tried never. it. Never tried it's it. It's near enough. I think that's near enough because this is what we were talking about. Steve, when he came, he was thinking, "Don't hit it thick. Don't hit it thick," which you do under pressure. Yeah, yeah. And he and he hit it too thin. Probably so. would have been better off hitting it thick, though. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if you go. You lock it in, no problem. I'm can't sure. Can't miss that, can you? Yeah, we well, can. Nice. No. Well, shot then. Yeah. You, well, now play with your right hand. Don't be playing with your left. Oh yeah, with left hand. Yeah. Here we go. Now let's see if you can head it too thin. Right, I'm gonna see if I can do I'm gonna see if I can do a Davis now. Oh that's But this is what I was saying, if the white mm. how the white didn't finish around the blue spot because the black, let's see, the black somewhere around wow. there, and somehow the white kept on going. Is this is this it? I mean, because you obviously you you should know. I mean like that's just it, yeah. I looked a bit thinner than that to me. Get nice and light, just for right, just get, let, get the cue through, don't stab it. No, I've got the wrong glasses on here, so I, I took ages, and then I just let go. Wagging the fingers. Brilliant, man. Still doing it 30 years on, and uh, I hope we can go for another uh, few years yet. Brilliant. Fantastic. Loved it. I hope I don't have to go for a black 17 <laughs> all final frame. Don't think I could handle it. Thank you again, man. Dennis, man, to love the frame. I think there's been a lot more media over this year because snooker as a sport is bigger and obviously the stories around the sport become bigger and the idea of a woman challenging a man which is not so new but in an open sport like snooker where everyone plays off the same surface if you like uh, it, it's created a lot of media interest and I, and I, I welcome it I think Rianne Evans is, a, is an excellent player I don't look on Rianne Evans as a woman or a man, 
I look on her as a player, and on that basis, she certainly justified her wild card inclusion for the World Championships, and I hope very much that she goes on from there to gain her tour card in the normal, proper way, and I think she has the ability to do that. Uh, I think she's done fantastic for the ladies' game, winning 10 world titles, and I think she thoroughly deserved a, a wild card in, in, in the World Championships, and she, and she proved why she deserved it. I mean, taking Ken Doherty to 10-8, to nearly, nearly going to a deciding frame, so I think it's fantastic for snooker to be playing in the men's game. After eight tough days of competition, the following 16 players made it through to the final stages of the Crucible to join the likes of John Higgins, Sean Murphy, Judd Trump, Neil Robertson and defending champion Mark Selby, looking to repeat his famous feat of 12 months ago when he beat O'Sullivan in the final. To beat Ronnie in the final, I think if I could like predict that I was going to win the World Championships and who I'd play in the final, I'd want to play Ronnie in the final and win because there's quite a lot of critics out there where if you didn't play Ronnie along the way or didn't beat Ronnie in the final, they'll turn around and say, well, yeah, hands up, he's done well to win the World title, but he never played the best. He never played Ronnie or he never played Higgins or Hendry and such, but to beat him in the final makes it even more sweeter. But Selby is well aware of the famous crucible curse, with no first-time champion ever able to successfully defend the title the following year. Uh, it, it wouldn't play on my mind to the point where it affects me. Uh, it would definitely be in the back of my mind knowing that nobody's won it and defended it, having won it for the first time. So, if anything, that will probably inspire me to go on and try harder to try and sort of break that duck as such. Coming up after the break, we'll hear from the five-time world champion about his preparations for this year's championships. <laughs> 2015 will see Ronnie O'Sullivan make his 23rd appearance at the Crucible. Since 1993, the Rocket has won five titles, reached five other semi-finals, and last year finished runner-up for the first time. He's also made three maximums in Sheffield, and this year will look to equal Steve Davis and Ray Reardon on the all-time winners list. Andy Goldstein caught up with Ronnie ahead of this year's World Championships. Let's look back at the season so far. UK Championship you won, of mm. course. Uh, Champions Champions you won. Mm. Uh, recently got beat in the final of the World Grand Prix. When you look back at the season so far, is it a good, uh, a good one? Has it been a successful season? I think I've had a great season, you know. Um, <coughs> Chen Du was OK. My, one of my first major tournaments this season, I made it to the quarterfinals there. And that kind of teed me up to, for the Champions Cup, which I, which I won. Probably played some of my best new I've ever played in the final against mm. Judd and Ding in the semis. So um, after that result, I was flying, you know, and going into UK Championships, I, I really fancied I was going to win it. And then I go and break my foot two days before I play, and I was like, I was so disappointed and so angry with myself, you know, because, um, you know, I, I felt like, you know, I had someone would have had to play like really good stuff to beat me, and uh, I still managed to win it. I think that tournament took a lot more out of me than I, I could have possibly imagined in many ways, you know, I kind of bit of a delayed reaction so for a month I felt a little flat after that but I feel fresh enough now you know I went to Germany and um, I had a stinker at the Masters but I, you know I, I tried to grind it out and uh, got to the semis and then I played some of my best snooker in, in Germany. And how is the foot now? Foot's great. Is it all healed? Because yeah. yeah. I saw you I saw you at the Masters you'd said on air that you weren't going to run it again mm. because you realised how dangerous it could be to your snooker mm. career and that's going to mm. take a back seat mm. then fast forward a couple of months and you're mm. running during a tournament. Yeah, I know, because I, I do realise that running has given me so much, you know, it helps me kind of release endorphins, it stops me from wanting to smoke cigarettes. I've got a lot of bad vices, you see, so running kind of, by going for a run, it stops me from doing a lot of the things that I know that I'd probably do if I didn't run. Mm. So I've not fully gone into running like I did, and the beauty of when I did break, broke my foot, it, it forced me to look for alternative ways to keep fit. See, I like to keep fit. And um, so I went to the gym, started going on a cross trainer, got into a bit of sparring, started to do a bit of boxing, realised that I actually enjoyed that more than the running. Um, but I realised that I still needed to have a, to do the run to get out in the fresh air over the woods. So I don't run anywhere near as much or as hard as I used to, but I'm enjoying it a lot more. So um, I'm probably fitter than I was even before because of that, because I'm doing other, other sports as well. And it's just good fun. You know, if you're going to turn your hand to boxing now, it's more difficult to make a maximum with a broken hand we than with a broken that. foot. <laughs> it's going to happen, isn't it? 
You won the UK Championships as a 17-year-old, become the youngest winner ever of a ranking event. But it took you, I think, nine years before you won the World Championships. Yeah. Was there ever a period in those nine years where you thought perhaps you should have won it that year? If I wouldn't have got maybe caught up in some of the little bad habits that I got into, which was I was partying, I was going out drinking a lot, and you know, my mum was put away in prison and my dad was away, and I just kind of lost my way from 19 to 25, really. I just kind of just um, lost the plot, if you like. So I didn't win the world title, I think, because I just wasn't in the right frame of mind to win it. Um, so sitting here now, I think I've done well just to kind of still be playing and still be fit and healthy and having won one. So um, it happened when it was supposed to happen, really. I was ready to win the world title when I was 25 because I was living the life of a snooker player as a professional, you know. I was quite focused, you know, nothing got in the way of me wanting to, to achieve what I wanted to achieve. If you could go back now and see the young Ronnie, mm. would you give him any advice or would you say just carry on doing no, what you No, no, I would. I'd definitely do what things would you say differently. To I'd do things differently, you know, but like I say, hindsight... No, I know that, but what would you have done? What are the major things you would have done? Would you have been more decorated now as a snooker player, do you think? Possibly, possibly. Um, maybe not by much, I don't know, but um, I probably would have... Uh, been a much more stable human, if you like. You know? <laughs> uh, I think them five, six years kind of um, left a little bit of damage, if you like. You know, and I've kind of worked on that over the last three or four years with Steve Peters, and kind of got much more of a handle on, you know, how to deal with emotions and how to deal with the highs and lows of life. Whereas maybe when I was going through that period, I kind of just. I wasn't used to losing, I wasn't used to being out of control. Uh, when I was a junior and as a top amateur, I was totally in control. I knew I was going to win, I knew I was the best player, best junior, the best amateur. I had massive confidence in myself. Whereas when I turned pro and I lost my way, I kind of lost a lot of confidence and a lot of self-doubt creeped in. I started to question myself and that was kind of hard to live with. It made me feel insecure and vulnerable and um, it took me a while before I came out of that, but I did turn it around just through perseverance, really. You had a, a chance to make it six. You had Mark Selby in the final last year. Mm. Um, your relationship with Mark on the table is one that snooker fans absolutely adore because it usually produces scintillating snooker for various different reasons. When you were going into that final, did you fancy it or did you think this is going to be a, a long few days? No, I fancied it. You know, I always fancy every match I go into play. I always think, you know, um, I've got a chance, you know, even if I'm not playing well, I've got a chance. If I play well, I've got a great chance. They're going to have to play really, really good to beat me. And in some ways, the mistake with playing Selby is that you go ahead. <laughs> I think sometimes you're better off just keeping it close. So, you know, Mark got, you know, got the better of me in last year's final. And I think at 10-7 up after the first day, I felt like I was maybe 10-4 down. Whereas Mark probably felt in his mind that he was ahead in the match, mm. you know, because I don't think he played great in the first day, and I didn't play fantastic, but I certainly should have been a lot more than three frames ahead, and I think that kind of knocked the wind out of myself. Was, it, was there a particular shot? I remember the pink you missed, I think it was in the afternoon session, in mm. the middle pocket, where 99 yeah. times out of 100 you'd potted that. That you was a it. bad miss, but I, I think the damage was well done before that. I think the damage was done at maybe 10-5, and I was in, and I missed the black off the spot. Yeah. And then Mark won two, the last two frames to go 10-7. And I think I went back to my room and I just thought, Phew. you know, I was, I was devastated, really, you know. And uh, it was hard for me to get going again the next day because I knew that he was just going to... You'd have to scrape him off the table. And, and I didn't really want it that bad, to be honest with you. I'd have liked to have won, but I wasn't prepared to kill myself. And I think if you want to kind of win the major tournaments, you've got to be prepared to hurt. And like I said, you know, um, maybe I've just kind of got settled on my career and what I've won, and I just want to have fun out there. And would I want to go through that again? Certainly not. Um, two days playing the Mark Selby in the final World Championships is, is, is a tough, tough thing. Does it matter to you that some people might not see you as the greatest ever until you either equal or beat Stephen as seven? No, not really, because I know that now, now you've got YouTube, People will be watching back in 100, 200 years. And, yeah, they're going to watch Davis, they're going to watch Hendry, but they're also going to say, you've got to watch this guy, Jimmy White. Oh, yeah, but there's this other guy, Ronnie O'Sullivan, who played a little bit like Jimmy White, but he won five world titles as well. So I kind of think that, 
you know, the way I play the game has kind of been a, a joy for the fans to watch. Mm. I've got pleasure out of the way I've played because I've played an aggressive attacking style. Hendry's very attacking and very aggressive, but people would kind of see him as the Iceman, whereas me, I think a lot of people go, you don't know what he's going to do next. So, you know, that's the way I play the game. You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. And uh, so for me, you know, I've, I've kind of got my own little niche in, in snooker. Maybe not been the most successful in tournament-wise. You know, obviously Hendry's got seven, Davis has got six, but five. No one's going to say that you um, you didn't know what you was doing. And when you look back at the five, which one gives you the most satisfaction? Which one do you think? The fourth. Obviously, the first is great, but the fourth when they were both born, obviously. But that was just like the best moment ever. That's it for now. But stay tuned to Eurosport for all the action live from the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. We'll be back in the summer. So until then, bye for now. <laughs>